If Uganda's economy, upended by the coronavirus, is to pull out of a tailspin, the government's saving grace will be anchored on fiscal prudence and tough austerity measures experts warn. But as technocrats attempt to revive the economy, they will be confronted by a number of challenges. Earlier this week, Parliament doled out 10 billion shillings to lawmakers from the supplementary budget in stark contrast of measures that could keep the economy afloat. The issue of the 10 billion shillings is an issue of the parliamentary commission. The money is ostensibly meant to maintain ambulances contributed by MPs to provide fuel and pay allowances for the drivers of the ambulances. This has elicited a groundswell of public resentment as thousands have signed a petition demanding that the funds are relocated to health centers and medical personnel. With the decision appearing to be out of touch with reality, the Bank of Uganda Monetary Policy Statement for April 2020, the COVID-19 impact on the Ugandan economy is projected to slow down drastically in the second half of the financial year 2019-2020 with GDP growth for the financial year projected at 3 to 4 percent. So uh, we are seeing more than 50 percent loss in the output would have produced in a year. Um, uh, putting it into context, uh, you must remember Uganda uh, is, um, uh, has a very high informal sector, estimated at 50 percent, uh, characterized by very many SMEs, um, uh, and, and that puts us at a unique position. We also have a very youthful population. 70% um, of the population is below 30 years old. So um, that means also we, our problem is quite unique. It means there is a lot of uh, energetic people right uh, at home, not working for quite some time. Or, uh, or their future is risked by this uh, COVID. In an environment of reduced demand, of course, demand for things like petrol and diesel has, has reduced by more than 50%, and government takes maybe 800 to 1,000 shillings per liter. So how, are they going to, how is the government going to sustain that payroll? We also have some stress because we've borrowed about 10, we've borrowed about 11 to $12 billion, and we have to pay interest on that. That's external debt. When you had on internal debt, then, then you can have a, a potentially stressful situation. Now, I have seen some institutions coming out very quickly to try and um, kind of minimize the, the, the likely impact. So the Bank of Uganda has already come out with um, you know, a very small reduction, 100 basis points in interest rate, but uh, it doesn't go far enough for me. And then they have allowed some restructuring of loans. This slowdown will be amplified by the lockdown measures spanning a period of 35 days. In Uganda, the rural economy is unique because it's got 71% of the labor force and 25% uh, of gross domestic product. But those people depend on hotels, they depend on urban areas to sell their produce. Now, unfortunately for them, some of this produce is fresh produce. So if it, if it is ripe now, it has to come off the farm and it has to reach the market. The biggest challenge the, the lockdown has created is a breakdown in the supply chain. Um, many people used to travel along the road and they would buy from these roadside markets. And then some of these buses and taxis, they're actually part of the supply chain. So the biggest risk is that that output can go to waste. And as it goes to waste, food may become a risk for the urban areas. Our revenue collections are going very down. Why? Because everybody's in the house. Even if we're not in the house, businesses are on the stand still. Tourism sector, our airport is closed. What about manufacturing? I mean, what? forget even about the big things. These, there are these small, medium enterprises that are supposed to be working. The salons, the garages. We are about the border economy. When they say we are about the border economy, it's just not for fun. It is because most of the youth are engaged in these particular activities. So, the indications are not good. Our first priority right now is to save lives. Uh, 
and that's why we have taken up uh, mitigation steps of, of uh, similar to other many other jurisdictions. I think 140 jurisdictions, uh, people have been asked to stay home. Uh, of course, that comes uh, at a cost um, in terms of employment and uh, in terms of uh, uh, turnover at business level and uh, profit at business level. And uh, they'll, they'll, a couple of jobs are going to be shared. Um, it's difficult, as you said, as you pointed out, that it, to come up with a figure. But um, uh, we should expect up to 20% of uh, loss in, of jobs in, the, in both informal and uh, formal sector. And of course, um, survival of farms will also be uh, 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 at risk. Um, already, even before the COVID-19 um, uh, epidemic, um, a lot of farms were not surviving past their second birthday. So with the loss of liquidity and uh, liquidity constraints, we expect more farms to, to, to the mortality rate of farms to, to go up. It is estimated that the biggest impact will be on the services sector, such as tourism, hotels, salons, entertainment, sports, recreation, and the informal sector. It will also batter mainly internal trade due to closure of markets in adherence to the presidential directives to suppress the further spread of the virus. The limited economic activity resulting from COVID-19 is likely to impact on the country's domestic revenue mobilization efforts and hence affect government spending. In an environment of slowdown, of possible recession, which can either be V-shaped if it comes out quickly or U-shaped, it takes longer. In the US, you know, some macroeconomic models that have been robust for some time show that they take around 24 months to come out of a crisis. And the US is a major economy, so it's 25% of the global. So if it has a problem, it has an impact on our exports. See, you know, Uganda exports coffee, uh, cotton, uh, tea, um, a little bit of, uh, of sugar. These industries are somewhat linked to how healthy those economies are. So if US is in lockdown, I mean, how much coffee is being drunk right now? In, you know, Starbucks is, is closed. It has some impacts on us, tea. Uh, those are our exports. But um, Uganda is one of the few countries where um, most estimates are very optimistic about you, Uganda's recovery pace. And um, the, the latest I've seen uh, estimates that Uganda will recover uh, and the economy will grow at 6% in 2020, which is uh, very, very, very unfamiliar with other jurisdictions. In, 20, in 2021, uh, we will grow at uh, 6%, uh, which, which is a very fast recovery. Uh, which will not be seen in other jurisdictions. And so it's not unique, even U Uganda's manufacturing sector will have some impact. Uh, the key major manufacturing or processing areas in Uganda is we have got sugar, uh, tobacco, cement. There are some raw materials in cement like clinker that we have to bring in. And so if the supply chain is not working, that can go down, then you have the steel industry, which still has a big portion of its raw material, like probably steel billets that have to be imported. So there are major risks that uh, I think may create the first depression in our lifetime in this economy. Mm, I saw people with some numbers uh, saying that the growth is going to reduce from 6 to 4 percent, uh, but I don't think that is realistic. Technocrats and policy wonks will need to hypothesize and realign government budgets to introduce austerity measures to lift an ailing economy. According to a draft research paper undertaken by civil society budget advocacy group CSBAG, the country can save up to 2.3 trillion shillings, an equivalent of 9.9% of the total budget of selected sectors. These funds can be redirected to the most critical sectors to jumpstart the economy. We passed the budget framework paper in, 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 uh, in February, the beginning of February. Still business as usual. Now we are debating the budget, the same budget we are debating it. 
it has nothing to deal with, with COVID. Like, this is the COVID situation. We need to now change the budget priorities. This is still business as usual. And that's our biggest worry. Because if you see you are providing for almost like 68 billion on a travel abroad, you are wondering where are you traveling anyway? Okay, there is the hope that everything is going to end and we shall still travel. For heaven's sake, this thing is going to end when the economy is released. So I think a number of things needs to be done. One is we need to have serious austerity measures. I know people hate the word austerity, but this is a time to reduce luxuries from the budget. One of the things we need to be doing is how can we save money to pump our economy? Because that is, is the most important part. In order to manage this situation, you have to get out of the conventional modeling and, and go into a social accounting matrix. Uh, fortunately, Uganda built one. The social accounting metrics, like I told you, will directly account for three things. Human capital. How many people were working in hotels that are not working now? Uh, how many people were working in the avian? Once you have that, then you, you also have the, uh, an inventory of capital assets. Uh, how much capital do you have in the banks and in savings? And then you also do a total inventory count. How many apples do we have? How many oranges do we have? Now, when you allocate the budget, now you have to go into areas that directly attack the problem or directly mitigate. So, for example, I know that uh, healthcare, retail, and um, food industry now are critical. Uganda's projected revenue for the financial year 2020 2021 is 21.5 trillion shillings and this may not be realized as the economy slows down. This could result into external borrowing as the public debt rises. The country's debt stock grew from 46.36 trillion shillings at the end of June 2019 to 48.91 trillion shillings at the end of December 2019. Of this, external debt was 31.53 trillion shillings, representing 64%, while domestic debt was 17.38 trillion shillings, representing 36%. This is an increment in nominal debt to GDP from 36.1% in June 2019 to 36.97% in December 2019. There are fears that the over-reliance on domestic borrowing crowds out private sector investments by hiking the cost of borrowing since government consumes a huge chunk of loanable funds from internal commercial banks. Before the pandemic struck, Uganda's expenditure growth had consistently outpaced growth in revenue collection, creating a widening financing gap and putting Uganda at risk of debt distress. Increasing debt also ties up resources in interest payments. Domestic interest payments are now the third largest item in the annual proposed budget for the next financial year at 4 trillion shillings, which is equivalent to 11.3% of the total. But as the sale of oil cratered on the international market, there are fears that Uganda, which had hedged its bets on oil production, could default in paying loans. It's not clear yet whether China will give the country a grace period to repay the loans as a result of this pandemic. Experts call this the debt trap diplomacy, where Beijing offers infrastructure loans and if weak economies can't generate enough free cash to pay their interest, their assets are taken. Uh, at the international level, I did not point that, that steps are being taken Steps are being taken at the international level uh, to organize uh, meetings and uh, negotiations, both uh, by teams uh, domestically and at, at Africa at a wall to reschedule uh, our debt. And, and, and this will give us a fiscal space, the fiscal space we need to revamp the economy. Remember, we pay up to 20% of uh, our budget uh, uh, in servicing debts, uh, amortization and, uh, and, and, and principal. So if we could uh, have that money, at least for this year, it would help us to fill the gap. 
The total proposed national budget for the next financial year stands at 44.6 trillion shillings, of which 40% is proposed for development expenditure and 60% for recurrent expenditure. For instance, during the half-year period of July to December 2019, URA was projected to collect 9.739 trillion shillings. However, URA collected a net revenue of 9.42 trillion shillings, thus falling short of 697.38 billion shillings. With trade and commerce coming to a shuddering halt, shortfalls in the next financial year are expected to fall more sharply, and this will leave the budget kitty further depleted. Uganda's domestic resource mobilization challenges include insidious tax incentives and exemptions that URA anticipates to forego about 500 billion shillings tax revenue in the financial year 2019-2020. Illicit financial flows from corporations through money laundering and financial misreporting results in an additional loss of a staggering 2 trillion shillings annually. There's also the underassessment of mineral royalties. For instance, the Energy Ministry collected a paltry 10.5 billion shillings in respect of mining royalties. However, a review of reports from the Customs and Excise Department of Uganda Revenue Authority indicated that government should have collected 70 billion shillings in royalties using the applicable rate of 5% from gold, tantalum, and tungsten. The tax body also experienced leakages due to poor working relations with other government bodies. For instance, the 2019 Auditor General report indicated that a total of 54 billion shillings wasn't collected due to non-coordination between URA and the gaming board. The tax body did not collect another 393 billion shillings due to failure by the URA to assess the Integrated Financial Information Management System. It was also registered that a number of expatriates do not pay pay as you earn due to failure by the Directorate of Immigration to share work permits issued with URA. A number of driving permits are issued without paying the requisite taxes and a number of instruments are registered by the Lands Ministry without paying stamp duty. Like most of Uganda's budgets in recent years, the proposed highest expenditure for the next financial year budget is the works and transport sector at 5.8 trillion shillings, followed by security at 4.5 trillion shillings, followed by interest rate payment at 4.1 trillion shillings, education at 3.5 trillion shillings, and the health sector at 2.8 trillion shillings. However, government needs to adopt austerity measures to eliminate any unnecessary spending and save money to boost critical sectors of production such as agriculture with emphasis on ensuring food security, import substitution strategy, strengthening security and health systems to guarantee health and safety of Ugandans. CS Bug's study suggests that some of the expenditures deemed as wasteful include welfare and entertainment, special meals and drinks, and ministerial donations amounting to 83.5 billion shillings from selected sectors. There's also duplicity in expenditures in all sectors on ICT and ICT equipment amounting to 225.3 billion shillings. Another duplicated budget items such as agricultural supplies, which is catered for under various votes, could result in a saving of 213 billion shillings. The study suggests that 715.2 billion shillings could be retained if government holds items such as staff training, maintenance, recruitment expenses, other than the, except for the health ministry, computer supplies and information technology, transport equipment, machinery, and equipment amongst others. Government can also save another 68.3 billion shillings on the spurfless expenditure on travel abroad, which barely has any cost benefit to the country. Travel inland amounting to 281.377 billion shillings could also be trimmed by 30% to 84.413 billion shillings.
The study recommends capitalization of Uganda Development Bank to the tune of 300 billion shillings. It is estimated that this will provide cheap credit to the over 18 million Ugandans who are eligible to participate in the financial sector market. Participation of Uganda Development Bank in the credit market will increase the amount of loanable funds within the market and this has a trickle-down effect on commercial banks lowering their lending rates. The study proposes that microfinance support center services should be supported to the tune of 100 billion shillings. This will boost the financial base of the microfinance support center through a transmission mechanism, improve access to credit to over 70% informal sector players, as well as a few formal sector players. Agriculture is yet another area that requires the spotlight to revive the economy. This can be anchored on supplying seeds, suckers and fertilizers, the recruitment of extension workers, establishment of buffer stores, establishing an import substitution fund and value addition processing centers. Without a healthy population and a robust team of medical personnel and properly equipped hospitals, there are fears that other interventions could be in vain. Emmanuel Mutaizewa, NTV.